Welcome to our 100th interview. This is the Monday, May 15th, 2017 episode of the History Author Show. Visit our iHeartRadio channel or subscribe on iTunes to enjoy a brand new episode every Monday morning. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. The sawdust is gone from the floor. Where we harmonize, sweet Adeline. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. Hello and welcome. I'm your host, Dean Carianis. And this is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio. This week, our time machine visits some of the most heated fighting, political and on the battlefield, during the American Civil War. We'll experience that great conflagration through the eyes of a soldier and his young love, a woman whose father just happens to be a copperhead, the derisive name for Democrats in the North, like this senator, who begin to doubt and work against Abraham Lincoln's war effort as the fighting drags on. Now, letters aren't rare from the American Civil War, but what is rare, very rare, is to have both sides of a correspondence preserved, a complete back and forth, and to have those letters in chronological order. I mean, think about it. Soldiers in the field traveled light. They had to. They couldn't save letters, they just didn't have the space. Plus they're in the rain and the mud, they're doing forced marches. There's not really time and not really conditions that you're gonna be able to save a letter that's written with ink or pencil or anything at all. And so often they just burn their letters and get rid of them. And of course, if they died, there'd be no letters to preserve. Into this historical void steps today's guest. His name is Gene Barr and he benefited from the chance discovery of these love letters from young Jenny Lindsay and her soldier in Union Blue, Irish immigrant Josiah Moore. This treasure trove gives us a full picture of a romance that adds tremendously to the historical record, especially since we're talking about the Western theater of the war, which gets overlooked because there's so much fighting back east in places like Virginia and down south with Sherman's March, etc., etc., Gene Barr's book is titled, A Civil War Captain and His Lady, Love, Courtship, and Combat, from Fort Donelson through the Vicksburg Campaign. You can find him on Twitter at GeneBarr underscore 55, or at Facebook.com slash Josiah and Jenny. His name is G-E-N-E-B-A-R-R, and Jenny spelled her name with an I-E. Okay. Now that we've mustered into the war, let's join Gene Barr and meet a Civil War captain and his lady. I'm joined via Skype by Gene Barr, author of A Civil War Captain and His Lady, Love, Courtship, and Combat from Fort Donelson through the Vicksburg Campaign. Thank you for making time to talk with the History Author Show. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Gene, your road to discovering Jenny and Josiah really is one of a kind. I think it's an inspiration to anybody who loves the Civil War or World War II or any topic and thinks, well, there can't possibly be anything new about it. Not only do you find this story, it kind of finds you. It's a road to discovery. These letters almost drop in your lap, not to take anything away from all the hard work you did. Talk about that amazing moment where these letters find you and you meet Jenny and Josiah for the first time. You know, that's a great question. And I, I was extremely fortunate. I mean, we all dream about, gee, what else can I add to this body of knowledge on Civil War, whatever period you're interested in, and to find these that were brought to me by a former business colleague who found them, inherited them. They were in an unheated cabin on a lake in Wisconsin. And he kind of called me and said, hey, I've got some stuff up here. I wonder if you could sell them for me. I think they're Civil War letters. And it was, well, sure, send them in. Let me take a look at them. 
anyway, I wind up buying them when I saw what they were, because I do believe that it is one of those pieces of correspondence, the back and forth that is that is so uncommon to have both of those. And I feel so tremendously fortunate to have been able to get them and to be able to preserve and to tell the story. Tell listeners that maybe aren't as familiar with the Civil War beyond those big set pieces like Appomattox and Lincoln being slain after the war. Why is it so significant to find these letters and find them in one place and find both sides? That's a great, great question, because, you know, what happened is, believe it or not, there are quite a few letters from soldiers back home. People back home tended to keep them. You know, they were evidence and communication from a loved one far away, be they in Virginia or Tennessee or wherever they were. So they would keep them. What were more difficult to keep for the soldier were those communications from back home. If you think about it, they're they're out, they're campaigning, they're out under the weather. It's really hard for them to keep these in a place where they're not going to get soiled or wet or where they just get tossed away. And so to have that back and forth correspondence is really rare. What's even rarer is to find this correspondence that is really a Civil War courtship. There are some that are back and forth that are husband and wife, but there are so, so few that show a Civil War or a Victorian courtship with everything that's attendant to that, where you can see how the relationship develops through this three plus years of communication. It's amazing the way that they write. I mean, these aren't people who are novelists, either of them. You know, they don't come from this literary background. And yet when you read it, I found myself thinking of how you write fiction. When you learn to write dialogue and fiction, the first thing that they'll tell you is, or among the first things, that dialogue in a book is not how people speak. If you and I speak to each other, Gene, I'm not saying, hey, Gene, so your book, Gene. Right. And yet yet you'll do that so that you can avoid a speech tag. And I said, or I thought, or I exclaimed, as they used to use, you try to avoid that. You speak much clearer. There's not a bunch of half sentences, hopefully, unless you're trying to make a point. So these letters, you read them, and I almost found myself thinking that they were fictional because their thoughts are so clear and together. They, they're they moving, they're building this relationship together. It almost reads as if it's fiction. The punctuation, though, is one thing, I guess, that maybe tips you off that this is a man in the field and this is a woman and they're not trying to write these to be perfect. They're writing them kind of on the fly. You get these letters, that getting them is one thing, having them, looking through them, but You had to transcribe them. And I was surprised, again, the completeness of these letters. There are so few places where you'll write illegible in your selections. Right. And I wondered if you'd walk us through that process as you sort through the raw material and you discover what I discovered reading them, that these are just so complete. How did you get them into the form of a book? Well, I did obviously a lot of thinking. It's one of the reasons why the book took 16 years from the time I bought the letters until the book was published last year. It took me 16 years because, one, I transcribed every single letter. I also wanted to make sure that this was a bit beyond just what they said in the letters. I wanted to put it in context, and I decided to take it further and to explore some of the themes of the time. And the other thing that I want to say, you're you're absolutely right. When you think about the fact that, well, one, Josiah was 27. He was educated. He was in college when he enlisted. But Jenny was 19 years old when they met. And you think about the ability of this 19-year-old young woman to write the way that she did is absolutely incredible. And of course, letters meant more at the time. That was how people communicated. That was how people showed their worth literally to others, showed their, their position in society, their ability to write. And the letters in many cases are almost like, I view them as almost like poetry. And they are absolutely incredible. But you're right. I was I was a bit surprised that there weren't more illegible sections. There's a couple sections that are literally cut out, and we get into that a bit in the book, where I speculate about why sections of a couple of the letters were cut out. But they did a phenomenal job in bringing them back and forth, and they're almost all there. And again, very few places where they're illegible. It took me a while from the time I first got them, once you get into the pattern of speech and kind of reference back, oh yeah, here's what they mean by that. And you're right. Some of the punctuation is making it very interesting, but it was, uh, once you get into the pattern, it kind of is a little bit easier, a little bit easier to see once you're able to do that. But I transcribed every single letter and did all the research here because I wanted, you know, I wanted to make sure this is right. And I wanted to tell the story the way that it ought to be told. 
and they didn't have any emojis or acronyms. No emojis. <laughs> LOL to lean no, on. You know, no, the... <laughs> no, none of that. None of that. As you can see, these are all four- and five-page letters in most cases. Um, a lot of times he he would dash off a letter quickly when, when they were being transported from one place to another. But in most cases, they're very long, very long letters and very detailed and talk a lot about what was going on on the home front. And sometimes, as a, you know, I will admit, some of them you look at, it gets a little mundane as she talks about going to see her sister in Chicago. But the reality is that's what soldiers wanted to hear. Soldiers wanted to hear that their loved ones back home were leading as much of a normal life as they could because they certainly were not. And they were there to protect and to look out for and to keep the way of life for the people back home. So they liked the fact that, okay, things are going, things are going well back home. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. You also bought, included with those letters, some photographs. There are two on the cover of a Civil War captain and his lady. I wonder if you'd describe this couple that you bring to life in the book and what you felt when you first saw them and said, wow, these are not just words that I'm learning these people through, but I have a little idea here of what they look like. Yeah, interesting, because I did not see the pictures of the both of them at the beginning, there was kind of an interesting thing that developed. I bought the letters from a guy I used to work with, and there were some CDVs that came with it. He wasn't sure what he had, and he would call me up every couple of months and go, hey, I found these other pictures. They look like index cards. I went, yep, I, I want those, and we worked out a deal for those. I wound up meeting the great-grandson of Josiah and Jenny. I guess that's the spoiler alert. Everybody knows now they got together after the war. <laughs> but I wound up meeting the great-grandson, who – did a tremendous amount of family history and had these pictures as well as others. And he was willing to bring them in and let me incorporate that as part of that. And you're absolutely right. After you read the letters and then you look at the two of them, it really does bring it full circle when you, when you bring the two. And it's certainly for me, looking at it, you get to know by the time you're done, you get to feel like you know the two of them. You think you, you, know, you believe you know their strengths, their weaknesses, what they like, what they don't like. You certainly come to appreciate the fact they're both very religious, which is emblematic of the time in many cases. But you really do. I found that I was, even though obviously they've been dead for a long time, you, you feel like you get to know them. I certainly did when I was done with the book. Do you know how they found their way here to a cabin in Wisconsin? It seems like a strange place to find them after you read the letters. It's it's a great question. The guy who I bought him from, who you know, as I mentioned, was a bit uh, he was a former business colleague. I said to him, I said, "Don't you want these?" He goes, "Well, the reality is that they belong to my aunt's husband's side, so it wasn't a blood relative, and they inherited the cabin and basically everything that came in it. So I'm not quite sure how they got there. Somebody on that side of the family, not a blood relative, has had them. What's interesting is someone as recently as I'll say the 60s or 70s." had taken care of them because they were in a 1960s, 1970s binder put in plastic. Someone had obviously decided to take care of them. They weren't just carelessly tossed in a cardboard box or thrown somewhere. Someone had set these aside, which helped to preserve them, even though they were in this cabin for years. So I very much appreciate whoever did that. As soon as I got the letters, I took them out and I put them in what I knew to be acid-free paper. I suspected that the what they were in at that point was not. So I wanted to make sure that I could keep them as best as I could. But exactly how they got there, nobody's quite sure. This is obviously fashioned as a love story. The letters lend themselves to that. It's also taking place against the backdrop of some key events in the war, both on the battlefield and the political fighting at home. I wonder how you struck that balance or if they led you to, to strike that balance based on what Jenny is saying, for instance, about her father being an anti-war Democrat against Lincoln. How did you decide to balance those two things or did you let Jenny and Josiah lead the way? I kind of let them lead the way. What happened was I looked at it, as I said, I didn't want it to simply be the letters. I knew I wanted to put it in some kind of context. And as I did more and more research, and I found, for example, Jenny's dad was a Democratic state senator who was elected in 62 in the Democrat resurgence when the war wasn't going too well for the union. And I found out about his copperhead leanings. I said, wow, this is a great part of it. In my own day-to-day -day life, I've been involved in the political world for years and years, so there was clearly an attraction there, particularly when you see somebody who was a member of the old Whig Party 
who was a House Republican in Illinois, and then he became a member of the Democrat Party and ran as a senator. And to see that in that context of that time, that turmoil, really was a tremendous attraction to me. So I said, this has to be woven into the story. And so, of course, it led me to say, so the people understood how significant this was. Who were the Copperheads? What were the Copperheads? How did they rise? What was going on in the U.S. that brought this great conflict that clearly was not just, you know, to make an assumption, okay, the South, you know, they were the Democrats, the North were the Republicans, and it was, there was this very clear delineation, and everyone had lined up on each side. Anything but that, particularly in the North, there was a lot of political turmoil, even in states like this, even in states like Pennsylvania, there was a significant amount of sympathy for the South. So I wanted to tell that story as well, the fact that it's not as cut and dried as you would think that it would be. I want to step back to that idea of the art of letter writing. That's a phrase I realized as I was reading a Civil War captain and his lady that I haven't heard maybe in 25, 30 years. We just don't really think about letter writing as an art anymore because we have so much instant communication. Yeah. Things like the emojis I mentioned. We had a college intern a few years back and I said, you know, when I was your age, we didn't have emoticons. If we wanted to smile at somebody, we had to actually move <laughs> our face. Like that's how, that's how deprived we were. But, that's true. But letter writing here, there's no pictures. These are not going to be instant emails. This is work. You have to make your words paint those pictures of what's happening with you. There's not going to be any of sending an email. There's not going to be any of FaceTime or whatever Snapchat is that I still can't figure out. So I wonder, what does this unique collection of letters you've put together here and the broader picture of the war that you've painted, tell us about that Victorian courtship that you mentioned in an era before telephones, much less any of those technological gadgets? You know, for me, it was very interesting. I've I've studied the Civil War for 50 years. Like so many people, it was a trip to Gettysburg as a you know, as a youngster, and it just got my attention. And like everyone else, you particularly when you live in the East, you tend to study you know, as you mentioned, you you study the Gettysburgs, the, you know, the Antietams, the Manassas, the Fredericksburgs, et cetera. And of course, this is the Western side. So I had to learn a little bit more about that. I had some knowledge of it. But the other thing that was very new to me, and when I started to read the letters, I said, okay, how did these people meet? So I started to read about the customs of the time, about how there was actually literally a prescribed way yeah. of meeting someone who, was, who you were attracted to. You couldn't simply walk up and say, hi, my name is Josiah. You had to go find somebody who knew the young woman who was willing to introduce, and then she had to consent to speak with you. And then you got into this, okay, you had, she had to consent to receive your letter. So the letters as I mentioned earlier, literally became an embodiment of what kind of person you were. If you could write well, that said something about you. And if you read the letters, as you look at them, you'll see that each of them, particularly Jenny, seems to apologize for you know, this poor letter. Because her view is if you wrote a poor letter, it reflected on you as an individual. It became also important to be able to communicate your thoughts, pen and paper, to be able to send that to somebody else. That was how people established themselves back then. It's always like, you know, when you tell people that people are always surprised when they would go hear an orator for two and three hours, you'd hear these the political debates that Lincoln and Douglas did, as well as others. I mean, Edward Everett down at Gettysburg spoke for two hours. Of and you said, why would people stand? Well, that was their entertainment back then. Yeah. They were entertained by listening to somebody for two hours. Well, in terms of letters, this is how people communicated and established the kind of person that they were. And also, this is how they courted. They courted through letters. And Josiah certainly hoped that Jenny would find his words genuine. That's That was part of the process. And I don't want people to get the idea that those letters are long and rambling and that means that they're boring. You can tell, especially in the beginning, if you're somebody who loves words and pays attention, that this is an important part of the courtship ritual here and of the pitch. And you see Josiah and Jenny in the earlier ones, maybe they're much more conscious of what they're writing. The writing is a little bit neater, subtle things like those punctuation we talked about. And I could see Josiah a little early on kind of chewing that pencil maybe as he's sitting out there right. in the mud and oh, what am I going to say here? How am I going to describe this? And then she's talking to him and she wants to keep him on the hook. They want to keep hearing back and forth. It's very different from today. And I know I met my wife through writing back and forth. We had a long distance relationship for a while and I could very much relate to that. And I thought 
that's something to bring it to life and then think, oh, right, there's this whole thing in the background that our country is maybe tearing itself apart and that I may die tomorrow adds so much more drama to that. And to have both sides of it in an underserviced theater of the war, that's really something that I bet people just will grab this book if they love the Civil War. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. And you're absolutely right. I mean, in terms of so much of it was written about the East, and of course, people hate to be pejorative. People probably tended to be a little better educated out East. So you don't get as many of these descriptions from the Western theater. So there's not as much written about Fort Donaldson, Shiloh, Vicksburg as there are about Antietam and Gettysburg, et cetera. So they are a little bit less developed. And, you know, you're absolutely right. As you look at these, you can imagine, and I I do believe many of them particularly are are like poetry, but, you know, Josiah, through some of the letters, paints this. There's a couple letters that, are, that, that I just love. When he talks about sitting in camp, he said, I think he said, lovely Luna, the moon is out, smoke is wafting off of the campfires. You can see him, literally, you see him sitting there almost composing this letter. And he does such a marvelous job, both of them, in terms of setting up that imagery that you can see, whether in the camp or her back home at her house, worried about not only Josiah, but a brother winds up going into one of the Illinois infantry units as well. And you can imagine her back home fretting about this as she's writing these letters and her brother is ill. It looks like her brother had malaria. And also thinking about her father, who at a certain point after 1862, of course, began to be the object of derision in a lot of places for his anti-Lincoln diatribes. And she wouldn't have been able to, I'm sure, talk about that. It just wouldn't probably wouldn't have been something she was happy about that here's her, I guess it's a timeless story, but still here's her future husband she maybe hopes and he's fighting for the union cause and then he's hearing about her father. It adds a whole other dimension of drama there. It does. And you know, it's interesting, even though in one of his letters, Josiah goes on a long rant against you know, the Copperheads, because by 1863, 1864, the soldiers had had enough of this. And if you weren't on their side, then then you were a traitor and an enemy. But interestingly, even though Josiah was well aware of what Jenny's dad was doing, you, you never see that in the letters. Josiah is always very cautious as part of this courtship, not to say, I can't believe what your father did or what's wrong with your father. He kind of shoves that off to the side. And in fact, one of the letters is from Josiah to Jenny's dad. It appears at some point he was trying to get him perhaps a commission in one of the new USCT units, the colored troop units, once blacks were finally allowed in. Um, So it appears that they had a decent relationship, even though Josiah clearly was not happy with the copperhead leanings of what would be his future father-in-law. Well, it's nice. Maybe another thing we can learn from today, right? Yes. Well, (laughs) you know what? That's a really good point. There was a lot of incivility. People talk about the lack of civility in politics today, and I'd agree with that. I've been in you know, politics for over 40 years, but people say it's the worst it's ever been. I said, oh, I'm not too sure about that. 150 plus years ago, we went to war over issues. And let's obviously hope we never get to that point again. But there are things we can learn about listening to others and trying to keep at least some semblance of civility and you know, learning from others and trying to figure out what their concerns are. So Josiah kind of figured it out with his future father-in-law. And I think you're right. I think there is a lesson there. And to digress a bit just about the political side of it and thinking of a Civil War captain and his lady every year, as I'm sure you're aware, because you've also been in politics and been in news myself and in politics, it's every Thanksgiving, let's say, there's always a letter that goes out from one of the campaigns or maybe from one of the national committees saying, what do you do about your relative that disagrees with you at Thanksgiving? And they're encouraging you what you should say in your fight and this and that. And I just think, oh, I don't know, maybe it's being from a Greek family. We We have our own things to fight about. We don't need anyone to tell us. <laughs> Usually we do our arguing with food, right? It's just you cook things differently. It's not really an argument because as a kid, you get to eat both kinds, right? Right, so, right, right. <laughs> but it's interesting to read something like this and then say, this is how people dealt with it when it was life and death. This wasn't just, hey, we disagree over the next Supreme Court nominee or we disagree over an issue. Think about the fact that this captain who was there every day watching his friends fight and die and maybe dying himself, hearing the whistle of bullets over his head, it'd be so easy for him to think, you know, there's other fish in the sea. Here, this woman's father is giving aid and comfort to my enemies, and I'm just going to be done with her. And yet they make this work through their letters. They talk it out. That's really important, and it's an example to us today when people fight so much about things, and I don't think they take that time. That's got to be something that made me, and so I'm sure made you, 
feel like, hey, Josiah is a pretty good guy. It's nice to see somebody do that. It makes you want to be a better person. I would agree with that. You know, it's one of these things where, as I said, you got to know both of them and my wife who obviously read the book. She got to the end and her, her comment was, I love Josiah. And I think, you know, that was part of it. He's, you know, he's a good, decent person. He does exactly what you said. He, you know, he listens. He's a very religious person. He's, he's an educated person. He's clearly patriotic. Again, for a country where he was not born. He's an Irish immigrant, granted at a very, very young age, and this is really the only country he knew. But you really do get to know both and gain a great appreciation for him you know, as a man. He was elected captain with zero military experience and by all accounts did well by his men. And I think his men saw what you saw in him as well. My guest is Gene Barr, author of A Civil War Captain and His Lady, Love, Courtship, and Combat, from Fort Donelson through the Vicksburg campaign. You can find him online at Gene Barr underscore 55 or like him at facebook.com slash Josiah and Jenny. His name is spelled G-E-N-E and that's Barr with two R's. Jenny goes with the I-E spelling, which I was a little surprised at. I didn't think that would have been in the Civil War. I would have thought it was a Y, but see, learn all kinds of things in this book, especially <laughs> since you're seeing her signature and looking so closely at it when you read the letters. Meg Groling at EmergingCivilWar.com writes of a Civil War captain and his lady, quote, There is certainly no shortage of books that contain letters from Civil War soldiers, but this one is especially interesting because most of the letters are in sequence. Gene Barr has built upon this foundation with supporting research. There is currently no regimental history of the 17th Illinois, but a Civil War captain and his lady is an excellent beginning to a study of Civil War units from the land of Lincoln. Gene, let's talk about that supporting research. You resist the urge of many authors to focus on the romance of the war and kind of look away, draw the curtain when the fighting stops. Just focus on the romance, the cavalry charges, and then say, well, the war ends and kind of 50 years later, there's going to be a Burns documentary and things will be very romantic. The nation will bind up its wounds and move on. You take the time here to discuss the trouble these men had integrating into life when they went back home. Maybe, say, men who weren't as fortunate to have somebody like Jenny waiting back home or somebody to give them such a positive influence through those letters. Many of them committed suicide. You describe one in the book. So as these men battle this new foe, which we would call today PTSD, it's a whole other story. It's a whole other war, really. So what drew you to include those stories in A Civil War Captain and His... You know, that's a great question. Some of this was that I was very fortunate to have one of my former professors at St. Joseph's University, a guy named Randall Miller, who is really an historian's historian, who read this twice for me and made some real critical suggestions. One of them was, why don't you talk about what happened to the men after they went into the war, this, this hardening or coarsening process. And so I talk a lot about that. And as you noted, there was the story about one of the men who was in Josiah's unit who wound up committing suicide. And I discovered that letter doing some research in the National Archives, and I'd just taken aback and had my eyes open by it and decided to pursue, okay, what, you know, what did happen? As you know, we, we all have this assumption that they got out, everything was wonderful. You know, we know it wasn't wonderful for those you know, African Americans who were in this country. We know that it didn't automatically turn great overnight for the freed slaves. There were significant problems. At the same time, it wasn't just a great place often to come back to for the men returning either. So I dove a little bit more into, well, what happened to some of these guys? And I think it's an emerging scholarship that's coming out now. There's a lot of works out there that I relied on for the book, but trying to find out how did Josiah and the men come back? One of the things I look at is for the men who came back in 1864 before the war ended, there weren't any great big parades for these guys. Whereas in 1865, as you know, huge parade through downtown Washington, day one for the Eastern troops, day two for the Western troops, because they couldn't stand each other. <laughs> but what happened to the rest of them? I delved into that a bit, and you're absolutely right. What we would today call PTSD was certainly out there, manifested itself in 
alcoholism and abusive family members and suicides and mental health issues. And we've for years, unfortunately, tended to shove them under the rug. And I didn't want this to just be everything was great. Even though it's a book that largely is a romance, I didn't want war to be seen as a romance. You know, as Lee said, it's well that war is so terrible or else we should grow too fond of it. Is absolutely true, and I think we need to understand what these men went through so we can better understand how succeeding generations went through it as well. We sometimes also tend, as I said, skip forward 50 years or 30 years maybe to the Gilded Age and see some nice Pullman cars. But yes. these men would go home, as I read in your book, and they're not being hired. People had many of the same stigmas that they have today about soldiers, certainly after Vietnam when there was so much upheaval. I had a friend actually served in Iraq. He's a veterinarian. Mm. And yes, we do deploy veterinarians still to help people with livestock, help them to feed themselves. And he said he came back, he says, and you know, people think, are you going to go crazy? Uh. It's a sincere, I'll be seemingly maybe ridiculous question, but there sort of was that same stereotype then. It wasn't just because of Oliver Stone movies after the Vietnam War. Hey, these were people that were fighting and killing their fellow man yes. in the trenches. So they were, they were rough guys. You write in the book that things like, once again, killing would be homicide. It wouldn't be something you got a medal for. And looting would be stealing now. You know, Foraging would be stealing. Absolutely. I thought that was great that you included that because it's so easy, as I said, just to focus on the set pieces of history. And it would be very easy here to focus on what's really a beautiful love story. It's nice that he makes it through the war. And it would have been very easy to shove that aside. Maybe that's why it took you 16 years to get it just right. I wanted to make sure I had it right. I wanted to do justice not only to the story of Josiah and Jenny, but to the story of all of the people of that period, the men who served, you know, the women who supported everybody else, because I wanted to make sure that I got this right. I knew I'd only have one chance to do it. But you're you're 100 percent correct. I was I was stunned by the parallels I saw having grown up in the 60s, early 70s that I saw between what was you know, what I read about some of the men returning and the Vietnam period. Uh, you know, when men were looked down on for various reasons, where they, as you point out, were not hired, they were told, I'm not hiring veterans, I can't trust you guys, I don't know what you're going to do. And we never think about that. Again, we kind of assume everybody came back, we threw them parades, we thanked them, and the world was wonderful. It was far, far from that. And I think it's, it's important not only to understand that for that period, but to understand that so that we can understand what today's veterans are going through and make sure that we do provide those kinds of supports for them, knowing the horrific things that they had to live through, the things that they had to see. And again, in the Civil War, you know, one of the things that I point out in there is that when companies were formed, companies were 100 men, they were formed not from you weren't as a Pennsylvanian, you weren't in company with somebody from Washington or California. You went into war with literally your next door neighbor, sometimes your literally your brother, the person you worked with, in Josiah's case, fellow students. And you would see them killed sometimes in the most horrific ways. And it had to have a mental impact on these men. It had to. Yeah. I do quite a few appearances. And one of the things that I do as part of that is kind of after talking about the book a bit, I say, you know, what I learned about it, I kind of jokingly call it the things I thought I knew about the Civil War. And I talk about some of the things that we've talked about here. That is the assumptions that people make. You know, in 1865, the world was wonderful and everybody went back and they went back to what they were doing and they had a wonderful life. And it wasn't always the case was not always the case. A fellow that I interviewed, he's at least 94, I'd say. He wrote a book called Battle Rattle, and it's about World War II. He was with Patton's army, and he mm. was one of the first to liberate a concentration camp. He just carried this around with him for so long, and he said they spent, whatever it was, 18 months teaching me how to go and kill, and then when I was done, it was kind of, okay, thanks for that, and go home. Exactly. People seem to think as if we were on vacation, he said, and it's so much turned it on its head that usually you think of the soldiers from when we view movies that they don't want to talk about it, and people at home are asking, hey, did you kill any Nazis? Right, right. And he said, it wasn't like that. It was the reverse. I wanted to talk about it. You know, I had a nightmare to his parents, and they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to even think about what he'd been doing. They wanted him to pick up his old life at the car dealership in his case. It sort of makes that light bulb go on, which is why I wanted to get into it, that just because you were in a war and you were victorious and you can come home and say, okay, we crushed slavery or we, we stopped the Nazis. And it doesn't mean that you then think, oh, well, hey, let me forget all those things. You know what I'm saying? Like, it seems as if we sometimes think that, I guess, that, that oh, you did something so great. It was so great you were able to do that. It doesn't feel that way when you're the one having brains blown all over you. Right. 
And again, a lot of that didn't come in until the 1880s. I mean, I, I was shocked to find out that the GAR was in fact banned by one of the churches out there, one of the Presbyterian churches. And, you know, ironically enough, I'm out of Josiah's faith said, oh, we don't want this GAR group, this extra legal group with these secret oaths, and these are horrible people. It's unbelievable. It wasn't until the 1880s or so that yeah. people finally said, oh, you know, these guys really did something pretty good here. And then <laughs> it's almost in the South that they, you hate to say they had an easier time, but there seemed to be more of an appreciation for the veteran there in many cases. I didn't study that as much as I did on the Northern side. But then, of course, as you see the 1880s and 90s, which I did find out that the Union and Confederate veterans got to be much closer. And there was that tie. And unfortunately, that tie was to the detriment of many of the black troops who did a phenomenal job and served tremendously well, well beyond what certain people thought they could. So it's fascinating to read how history develops. Yeah, this was a great book for that. I, I saw that thing. I would never have known that either about the the GAR having nobody even in it, barely a couple of thousand guys in the beginning. And I know. This wasn't that they yeah. they wanted instant nostalgia, and people didn't either. They'd just been through it, I guess. It's always different. Yeah, they just want to forget about it. Put it behind. Go back to your farming. Go back to your teaching. Go back to your clerking. I don't want to hear yeah. if you had to kill. I don't want to hear what you stole. And a lot of them didn't want to talk about it either because they knew it would not be well received. So they just kind of went back and suppressed this. And as, you know, as we say, one of the quotes from the book was the guy who said, I've had Shiloh since the sixth day of April. And it's just, wow. I mean, he viewed the battle as a disease that he carried with him to the end of his life. You write in A Civil War Captain and His Lady that Jenny makes clear, quote, that she was much more concerned with Josiah's physical and spiritual welfare than ultimate victory. You mentioned a little bit earlier that they both had strong Christian faith. How does their shared faith help carry them through the many challenges, some of those we just described, but also the temptations of war and a long separation? Great question. And I think that for two people who believe in the afterlife, I think that they were much more concerned, as many people were of the time, that if you have to die, that you're going to die what they would call a good death, a good Christian death. And I write about that in the book as well. And I think Josiah... Uh, I'm sorry, Jenny wanted to make sure that as Josiah progressed, he, he kept himself immune from so many of those vices. As you know, during that period, people looked down on gambling. They certainly looked down on drinking, even though there was enough of that in those periods. And I think she wanted to make sure that he kind of absented himself from that. As a fact, I think being 27 years old and having lived for a few years more than the average soldier probably helped him a bit. She clearly helped, you could tell in the letters, I believe, keep him on the kind of largely the straight and narrow and keep him progressing. But again, I think that the fact that they were both so religious, believed so much in the Christian faith, and they believed in the afterlife that they wanted to make sure that the life they lived on this earth was a good positive one. And that was her admonition to him. Of course, she also typically requested that he come home. I think she would see so many others come back home on leave and Josiah, for various reasons, only got home a couple times. But that's just the way that things work sometimes in that service. I spoke about your including of the PTSD idea, the battle rattle, or I think in this era they called it soldier's heart, and this trauma that you would have and carry with you really for the rest of your days as mental scars, not to mention physical scars. Another thing that you delve into in A Civil War Captain and His Lady is the role of women like Jenny. And that's more than just sort of the fainting and the pining away at a window and things like you just invoked with her wishing that he would come home so they could go to a dance. All the things that we absorb from the old movies that are part of that romance myth that has been built around the war. You quote one historian saying that men had saved the Union, but women had saved the Republic from the perils of this massive standing army that is something the American Republic from Washington on really had avoided having. This is why you end up with those whole neighborhoods worth of men going to war, right? They exactly. have to enlist. It's not a professional army like we have today. So can you expand on this a little bit for our listeners? Tell them who they're meeting here in Jenny, because they're not just meeting somebody who wants to write flowery letters and get married and run away, live happily ever after. Yeah, exactly. We meet a 19-year-old woman who, in my view, based on what I've read, is kind of wise beyond her years, who does act as kind of that grounding for Josiah throughout the three years of his service, who continues to remind him to behave in an appropriate manner, to resist the temptations, to fight bravely, to do what he needs to do, take care of his men, etc. And you're right, that is an important one 
for these men to know that there are people watching from back home who are waiting for them, who want them to live the good life. It's important for them to be reminded of that. Interestingly, a lot of the women on the home front also supplied more of a support that is rolling bandages, doing things. And there's not much evidence that Jenny participated in that. And I speculate that maybe because of her father's political leaning, she might not have been welcome in some of those get togethers there in Peoria, but she clearly provided that grounding and that attachment to home through her letters that Josiah so desperately needed to know that things were normal, to know that there was a world outside of this crazy and violent world that he's fighting in, that if he can get through this, he knows is back there waiting for him. I have one final question for you. It's about late in the book. You have a picture of David, who you mentioned earlier was Josiah and Jenny's great grandson. He's with his wife, Liz. Where are they sitting and how did you track them down? You said they weren't where you got the letter. So how did you find this fellow and his wife? Well, what happened, the guy who I bought him from, David Jupe, got in contact with this guy who was my former business colleague. And he asked Bob about the letters and he explained what happened. And then, you know, Bob got to me, the guy I bought them from and said, hey, there's this guy, he's very interested in the family history, knows you have the letters, you're willing to talk to him. So we were. So long story short, I, during one of my trips to Illinois to do research, uh, we got together and he brought out all the stuff that he had. We had a great visit. He was tremendously helpful. And one of the things that they talked about, and I have them sitting on, and the reason that picture's in the book is a picture of them sitting on this little Victorian love seat. And family history is that that is the love seat on which Josiah proposed to Jenny during one of his trips back home. He made a couple trips back home during his service. One of those, he apparently sat on there and he proposed to her. And so that's been handed down through the family. David, and this is you know one of the things that is tragic about this, David, who was so interested in this story, got severe Alzheimer's and died in October of 2015, and unfortunately never saw the book come to fruition. That's one of the things that I truly regret, that it didn't come out so that he could identify with it and see it and appreciate it because he was so interested in having the story of his ancestors told. Well, it's nice that he's able to be immortalized in the book. And something else I was thinking as you spoke about it for Jenny and Josiah, you mentioned that for some reason unknown, they are not buried together. I think it's nice that in your book, A Civil War Captain and His Lady, we can say they're together again. They're right there on the cover, and I'm sure that that would have pleased them. They're together on the cover, fortunately, and they are buried apart, which I do find interesting. The family doesn't know why, because as I say in the book, they apparently were so devoted to each other for all the years of their lives after they met. But yeah, we did put them back together on the cover, and I'm so pleased that we're able to do that. Well, Gene Barr, author of A Civil War Captain and His Lady, I want to thank you for introducing Jenny and Josiah to us today and to me personally. I think they would indeed be very pleased that they had the luck, the good fortune, or as they'd have viewed it, that they were blessed to have their intimate letters fall into such capable hands. Somebody who took the time over 16 years to whittle it down and give us a really great read. I wish you the best of luck sharing their story. Well, Dean, thank you, and I really appreciate you joining with me today to help tell the story. I really do appreciate that. Well, the honor was all mine. That's why I do this. (laughs) Thank you. Again, the book is A Civil War Captain and his lady. Love, courtship, and combat from Fort Donelson through the Vicksburg campaign. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at historyauthor.com. And we hope you will click through there or even navigate through the Amazon banner on our homepage at historyauthor.com the next time you purchase anything from Amazon. You go to historyauthor.com, we take it Amazon, And Amazon.com gives us a small percentage of every dollar you spend at no additional charge in your shopping cart. For just a few extra clicks, you can help us keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My thanks to Gene Barr for joining us and for sharing this really rare look at love letters during the Civil War. Visit him on Twitter at GeneBarr underscore 55 or at Facebook.com slash Josiah and Jenny. <laughs>
And while you're at it, let us know what you think of the book, the letters, and the interview on Twitter at History Dean or Facebook.com slash History Author. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for next Monday's all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you're listening. And if you're an iTunes subscriber, please take a minute to leave us a review. Well, until our next trip into the past together, thanks so much for time traveling with us today so we can go back with Gene Barr and meet Josiah and Jenny. Have a great week, everybody. Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the eyes of the regular guys. Oh, New York ain't New York anymore.